Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Ralph indicated, Paul Delaney, second vice president. My pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, since October of 2018, Jenna Hines has been the Youth Outreach Coordinator for the RASC's National Office. Uh, she, uh, where are we going here? Uh, she leads the Robotic Telescope Project and runs nationwide astronomy outreach and outreach training programs. Busy woman. Uh, she's a prolific engager of social media. Any of you who are on the Twitterverse will be very familiar with her uh, broadcasts. Uh, is an avid photographer and a naturalist. She received her master's uh, degree in uh, science communication and public outreach from the University of Edinburgh. I've now made an appointment to talk Scotch with her. Uh, and a bachelor's degree in biology from Mount Allison University. She enjoys rock climbing and playing science songs on the ukulele. Interesting. Personally, I've never met a jellyfish I didn't like, but we will hear all about jellyfish she has known. Jenna. Thank you so much for the introduction, Paul. Am I okay there? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction, Paul. Um, and I didn't realize that you wanted to talk Scotch specifically. I actually, only about 70% of the reason I moved to Scotland was for Scotch. The rest was for the program. So, hi everybody, and I'm Jenna. Um, I came to astronomy from a really interesting angle, uh, but before I get into any of how I got here, um, I did want to ask you all a question first, which is, what are your earliest memories of time and sp or of space? Because I find that almost everybody has some early memory from when they were a kid, and I realize it's kind of hard to see you guys. Um, is there anyone who has an early memory from when they were? Oh, thank you. There we go, look at you all. <laughs> An early memory from their childhood of space. Yeah. Well, it's sitting on the shore of a lake where I used to camp with my uncle, who is a member of this society, but isn't here tonight, and having him point out constellations to me. Oh, lovely. That's wonderful. It's so nice to have those memories of when you're young. Anybody else have any memories from their childhood? Yeah. Just growing up back home in Newfoundland and seeing the Milky Way. <sighs> oh, you lucky people with all of your. Lack of light pollution. <laughs> I'll add a southern hemisphere perspective to all of that. It was very early on looking up and going, what is that? And it was actually the Southern Cross. So Alpha and Beta Centaurus and finding out that they were closer stars other than our sun. So. Oh, amazing. Oh, fantastic. I love hearing stories of people's experiences when they were younger. I, I do find that it really brings everybody together. Oftentimes when we um, are inspired by space, it's when we're, when we're quite young. My memories of uh, my youth, I don't have any photos of this time, but that's my cottage. Um, and at my cottage, we used to spend a lot of time lying on the dock, and we'd also go and visit my grandparents in Florida, and both of those times we would gaze at the stars. And my parents didn't know any constellations beside Orion. So we got really familiar with Orion, and then we just guessed at everything else. <laughs> and so we, I could identify Orion's belt at the age of five, and then I just made up other ones, like Orion's car battery and Orion's chair, and Orion's hat. And really, honestly, is that not what the constellations are already? Um, they're all kind of a little made up. I also had a very strong belief for some reason at the age of, at, at quite a young age, actually until quite an older age, probably about 10 or so, that all the stars were painted on a canvas that was exactly two kilometers up. I'm not sure why I knew two kilometers specifically, but I was absolutely sure of it until I, of course, learned that that is absolutely not the case. So now, all those misconceptions solved. I now do a whole bunch of space outreach. Um, this is an event that I was at with a bunch of volunteers from Toronto Centre, actually, at the ROM a couple weeks ago. And we were doing a, a, some lunar sketching with it. It was lovely. But that's not where I started. I actually started, as, um, as Paul mentioned briefly, I did a degree in marine biology earlier than that. And back on the UK front, I started knee deep in tide pools. Uh, this is the best tide pool around. This is in near Bamberg Castle in the north of England. It's a fantastic one. I'm the one in the pink. And I spent a lot of time crawling around and digging up critters. I also spent a lot of time in touch tanks grabbing critters, as you can see. Quite an affinity for hermit crabs. Um, that being, so when I was a kid, when I was about that age, I found out that there was an actual job for a scuba diver to go and pick up animals for the touch tank from the ocean. And that was my dream job. I wanted to be that diver. Of course, I didn't do that, but that's OK. I've done some other cool stuff. It did inspire me enough to go and do scuba diving as a big part of my hobbies and eventually as some of my research. Uh, I learned to dive when I was 14, and then I went and did my undergrad in marine biology. I did pay my dues on the mud flats of St. Andrews, New Brunswick, 
and minus 28 degrees. So I did the terrible marine biology so that I could do the fun marine biology. <laughs> So this was down on a, a research trip to the Caribbean um, in Bonaire. That was where I did most of my research. And I'll, I'm going to briefly talk about my research because you've given me a platform, and I love the ocean. Um, so this is Bonaire, tilted so that it's correctly angled for what's north and south. And when the wind comes across the ocean and hits Bonaire, it hits the eastern side of it. So it comes from the east and moves west. Because of that, the eastern side of Bonaire is really uh, battered. It's big craggy cliffs and high waves and there's no coral growing on that side because coral just doesn't grow in conditions like that. The coral all grows on the leeward side, on the west side. And all along there it's this big long fringing reef that goes all the way down. It's absolutely gorgeous. This place has been protected for probably about 30 years now, but back in the early 2000s because of human impact and climate change things got a little dicey. Uh, one of the, usually the hurricanes came from east to west as they all typically still do, there was a hurricane that came through that went west to east. And because of that change in the climate and that change in direction, a whole bunch of coral got destroyed on the leeward side when it shouldn't have been destroyed. So my research in university was looking at that uh, one particular type of coral as a measure for how the reef was rebounding. That coral is staghorn coral or Acropora cervicornis. And it's doing so well, look at that. I was so excited when I found that colony. I was so excited. This stuff grows really fast compared to a lot of corals. So this grows at about 10 centimeters a year. So oftentimes people use it to rebuild reefs. Um, so this is where it's sort of all my passion kicked off. Uh, and I did get to go on some really cool trips and meet, actually, so this isn't technically a jellyfish, this is a coral. They do have similar, similar um, defense mechanisms. Where they have like tiny harpoons that shoot neurotoxins into your skin. But, yeah. It's really great. Um, nematocysts is what they're called. But I did get to go on a different trip. I got to go to Sable Island, where I met a lovely jellyfish. And I'm going to throw in a picture of horses, because that's what everybody expects. Lovely horses. Um, then I met comb jellyfish, which I was really excited about. These little guys are only about the size of grapes. And they're really cool. This is the, a shot in broad daylight, so you can't really see it. But when it's darker and it's just a single angle of light, they have these pretty little rainbow things down their sides. They're like little cilia, they're little legs that help them swim. And as they swim, they send these little rainbows down either side of them. I'm very fond of that jellyfish. Onto a different jellyfish. This one I actually only made a con mental connection with it recently. This was on a trip in Florida where I went to an underwater research facility. And so you had to dive to get there. You had to dive into a lagoon under a little pod, and then you came up through a portal and into this research lab. And in... I mean, point with the pointer, which I didn't practice with. I'm not sure where it is. There we go. Um, so in this jar over here, there's a jellyfish called Cassiopeia. And the reason it's called the Cassiopeia jellyfish, do you guys know the story of the whole, you know, Cassiopeia's upside down in the stars because she was too vain and she needed to be shown how to be humble? That jellyfish sits upside down on the ocean floor. I had no idea that was why it was called the Cassiopeia jellyfish. This is what it looks like. And it, instead of floating as you would normally see in the water column. It flips upside down, sits on the bottom. These things blend in with the grass in the background. This is called um, turtle grass, seagrass, or uh, thalassia. And they'll sit down there and catch little critters through there. I have been stung by a great number of these. And in fact, even at this particular lab, I touched the Cassiopeia jellyfish. It's not so bad when you touch your hand because your hand has pretty thick skin. And I went, haha, that was cool. Rubbed it on the towel, rubbed the towel on my leg. Yep, bad idea, don't do that. <laughs> I did still love the stars throughout my whole undergrad degree, and I was really lucky to go to a very small school in small town New Brunswick, so I did escape the lights of the city and get to see the stars without any light pollution. And I also, luckily, I'm not, I'm not an astrophotographer, to be clear, I'm not particularly good at this, and this is from 2012, so cut me some slack. Um, I was lucky to have very supportive and nerdy friends who, when I said, hey, it's exam season, it's 11 o'clock at night, who wants to come out with me? to the middle of the salt marsh and take pictures of the stars. Many of them came with me. We had about six of them. I was really impressed. Um, you can see three of them jumping around on hay bales. What, what do you do in small towns, right? Um, and then I got my first picture of the Big Dipper. Isn't it lovely up there? I got even better even throughout the night. This isn't stacked or anything. I got better even throughout the night and I got Orion there, right up there. Not bad, not bad. Even foreground, look at that. Right, not too bad. Um, at this time, yeah, Beetlejuice is bright. Look at it. I had no idea things were going to change. I didn't even know it was a variable star, um, and I didn't know what 
that was. I didn't know anything. I, I, all I knew was that that was Orion. Back to that whole five-year-old Jenna being like, oh, yes, Orion's belt. I see that. Where's Orion's car? Is it over here? No? Down there? No? <laughs> um, so I, I, I loved marine biology, and I still love marine biology, but I found that I was just not a very good scientist. That was the problem, is that I don't, I didn't, I never made up data, but I got real close. So I stopped doing science, <laughs> um, and I went off and did science communication instead uh, in England. I left out that entire year because I didn't do anything related to marine biology or anything related to space, and so it didn't seem that important. Um, it was fun. I did cool stuff. I worked with the zoo, and I worked with um, the neuroscience facility there, so I learned all about brains and stuff. But after that, I came back into my true passion. I actually came here. I was a host at the Science Center. And I found out recently that Ralph, you were a host too, wherever Ralph was gone. And this is so exciting. So I was a host here at the Science Center. And I loved that job. That job was great. It was perfect coming out of a degree in science communication where you don't know what you're doing and you just want to practice. And you got to go and like you got to go out on the floor, you got to try cool stuff, you got to learn new things. I did naturally gravitate towards the animals. So that's Henry. He's lovely, he's a ball python. He's probably about 15 now. Sweet, you should come by sometime. Um, and I also, I, leading up to this point, I had done a little bit of work with, with wildlife before. I'd worked with, um, oops, sorry, I worked doing wildlife rehabilitation. And it just so happened that at the Science Center, oh, I had to throw in some photos because they're cute. Um, that's a northern flying squirrel. There, he's the cutest of the animals I worked with. And there's a groundhog. Um, the Science Center had an, an exhibit on wildlife rehabilitation, and it just so happened that about a month prior to the exhibit coming in, a hawk flew into one of our windows, and I, I, we watched it fly into the window, and so we knew that it had gotten hurt, and it flew off, and it sat by the parking lot, and, and we were kind of like, uh, like it's standing on one leg, it's looking okay. I'm gonna go out and see how it's doing, and I walked out, and it flew away, and I was like, okay, if it flies away, usually the animal's all right. So we, we kind of left it. We kept an eye on it for the next month or so. Um, we'd seen it standing around on the ground and on top of the bird feeder, like, where did they all go? Why'd they leave? Should be easy. Um, and it wasn't quite doing quite as well as the other hawks in the area. And then, luckily, on one day, um, a uh, two girls were walking down behind the science center, and they saw a hawk fall out of the sky and onto the ground. And then they went and told one of my coworkers, who came and found me, and said, Jenna, what are you going to do about it? And I said, great, let's go get it. Um, that was not what I was supposed to say. <laughs> But we did. We did go get it. And this is what the end result was. Is the hawk in the Science Center lab coat. I was wearing, I was wearing oven mitts, not technically PPE, but still. <laughs> and then we tossed it in a box and I took it to the, to the wildlife center. There's my supervisor there. I don't, don't think I was supposed to let anyone know that I did this and that she was okay with it. Um, so you're not supposed to do this. Uh, and I found that out the next day. A lot, of, a lot of my career has been, hey, you wanna do this thing? And me being like, yeah, sure, what could go wrong? Um, and and that's, what, that's what this was. Uh, I thought, you know, here's a problem. I'm gonna solve the problem. I have the experience. I feel comfortable with this. This will be fine. And then my manager sat me down and she said, so, I'm sure you knew this was coming. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you really shouldn't be picking up hawks on work time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, I guess not, eh? And she's like, yeah, no, it's dangerous. You're not, that's, you're not supposed to be doing that. And I was like, yeah, mm, mm, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, you know, I, I spoke to, I spoke to, I had a supervisor who was an ornithologist. And she's like, I spoke to the ornithologist. And she said, you probably didn't even consider it. And I was like, yeah, no, no, it literally hadn't occurred to me. She's like, so now that I've told you, you won't do it again, will you? And I'm like, mm, no, I'll do it again. She's like, she's like, okay, well, now you know. <laughs> she's like, I understand. I had to have this conversation. <laughs> um, it, was one of, it was one of my more fun experiences at the Science Center. And because of this sort of instinct to just kind of say, yeah, I mean, how bad could it be? I ended up doing a lot of really cool stuff. I got to go on live TV. Um, and this was, this was the animal room fellow, the one who takes care of our animals, came up to me at a presentation and he said, I don't want to drive into the studio tomorrow. Do you want to do it? And I was like, sure. And he's like, you have media experience, right? And I'm like, no. He's like, oh, no, you'll be fine on live TV, whatever. <laughs> and in fact, the, the, the person who was in charge of our media relations even said to me in the car on the way there while I had all these animals with me, 
you've been media trained, right? And I was like, no, 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 no. He's like, ah, I'm fine. <laughs> it's like, great. I didn't mess up. That was good. Um, I got the opportunity to bring my life truly full circle and back to touch tanks. And I got to host an, a touch tank on live TV, which was the best day of my life. It was so great. Except for that eight-year-old in the back dropped the brittle star on live TV. <laughs> but luckily, I don't really process these things in the moment. So I was just like, oh, yeah, OK, no problem. Back in the tank. Here's another thing. <laughs> it's fine. Everything's fine. It was great. Um, it, was a really, it was a really cool way to wrap up that part of my life and to, to really get to come full circle on all of the marine biology stuff. But the ultimate part of being a host is being a planetarium host. That was the coolest thing you could possibly be. Yes. It was so cool. You got the number seven key. And the number seven key was special. It let you into the planetarium. That meant they trusted you with a room that wasn't surveilled. So you could nap if you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I definitely didn't. Nope. There was a host that was once caught living there. Oh. Yeah. I that was a secret. Don't, ooh, ooh, this is being broadcast. Don't come for me, Science Center. <laughs> so I didn't take any photos in the planetarium. This is from away, but I did get the chance to do planetarium stuff. I had no experience in space. I was still not figuring out the constellations. I had no idea what was going on, but my boss somehow trusted me to do this and just kind of went, off you go. Best of luck. And I could not have asked for a better way to learn. It was so cool because so many people come into outreach because they care so deeply about space. They just, they want to share it with everybody. I did not come in on that angle. I didn't know anything. But I got the chance to learn. And I got the chance to learn with a world that I could control around me, which was the coolest way I could have learned. So we spent hours and hours just playing with planetarium software and flying out of the galaxy and seeing how the super clusters are structured. And I did that in shows, too. And I almost made like three people throw up because I'm not a good pilot. <laughs> Shouldn't have been allowed to do that. I didn't ask for permission. I asked for forgiveness. It was fine. Um, and in those shows, what I always told people was, I, I always really liked the winter season because we would do the sky that evening and the winter season had Orion. And everyone likes Orion. No, one, no, one, no one's mad about Orion. And I would always show people the constellation and how you could see. You know, and if you go to a dark sky, you can see the Orion Nebula. It's really exciting, but you got to go to a dark sky. And then I was walking home one night and I live right, at, uh, on, right along Riverdale Park which is a really good spot to observe. Um, there aren't a ton of artificial lights around. And I was walking along and looking up and Oh, wait a second. Wait a second. That, that, that's the Orion. I'm like looking around for people and being like, somebody, somebody, that's the Orion. Can you see the Orion? I'd be like, can you not see that? Uh, yeah, so that's how I got the title of crazy person in my apartment building. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was so excited. It was so excited. The next, the rest of my planetarium shows were like, oh my God, guys, 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 you can go outside right now. You can go and see. You can go see. Go, 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 go there tonight. And it clearly, it worked at some point because I'll bring up that I have the photo sitting there of, a, of the Orion Nebula. It worked at some point because I actually got, my boss got a letter saying, Jenna's planetarium show encouraged us to go find Orion and see the Orion Nebula. So it worked for at least one person, that violent passion. <laughs> and with learning all of this stuff about space and getting more exposed to sort of that world and not just the world of wildlife and such, I got even cooler experiences. I got to host an episode of Science Max where we did lunar landers and how did, it was essentially the egg drop challenge but with pumpkins. Um, and we got to see how we could make things not break when they land, which is sort of how we used to do outreach with getting rovers to land on Mars, that sort of thing. We're not going to watch that. <laughs> my, my boss, when he found out earlier this week that I did this, and he made us watch the entire episode. Um, so we're not going to re relive that experience. <laughs> That's enough. If you want to see it, it's on YouTube. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was really neat to get the, get the opportunity to give it a try. And then finally, after all of this learning about space and getting more in touch with thinking about non-Earth-based things, although I did still have uh, bring out the snake for solar observing one day. That's Henry there. Um, I did get to meet the Ross Toronto Center. That was, they, you guys all come here on Saturdays, and we do outreach and talk about space. And so I got pretty familiar with you know, everyone who's out there. I brought out Henry, and, and then I found out that the RSC had a job opening. And I asked the volunteers if they knew anything about it. And they're like, National has staff. But <laughs> and so that, that, that should have been an indicator for what National was like. Um, and I applied, and I got the job. And, and now I get to do space stuff all the time. The coolest part about all this is that, first of all, all of you guys are wonderful. I got to go inside the 74-inch telescope at the DDO on my second week on the job. 
So this is not a super clear photo. But what you can see, so there's my phone and my jacket, and then the back of Jeff Booth, and then the front of Jeff Booth, and then there's Chris. It was Halloween, by the way, <laughs> um, just to be clear. <laughs> so you can see this is the telescope back here. I had... I mean, I don't even own a telescope. I still don't own a telescope. I just use everybody else's because there's so many people who have them. But to be able to stand inside one and like stand up inside one, not have to crouch or anything, that, that was so cool. It was like the coolest way to enter working in this job. Ian Wheelband took this photo of me being like the happiest kid on earth to be standing in a telescope. I got to do a bunch of other stuff. I got to do a bunch of outreach with a bunch of Toronto Center volunteers at the DDO. I got to, this was when Paul and I met. We met on the roof of the York parking lot in minus 40 in January. Yeah, it was cold. We were doing the lunar eclipse. I had originally, we had this, this whole plan to do live photos of the moon and I was gonna tweet them and it was gonna be great. And then it was gonna be from our telescope in California and it was cloudy in California and it was not cloudy in Toronto. <laughs> and so my boss was like, well, you gotta do something. And so there we were. All of my electronics stopped after an hour. They all died. And I, my brain kind of turned off too. I had to give an interview on TV. I forgot to even say that I was with the RASC. I was just like, yeah, 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 let's talk about the lunar eclipse. It's going to be great. Everything's great. It's not minus 40. Everything's fine. <laughs> so it was, it was a rough one. I, I never went and looked for the link for that. And I don't feel like you need to either. Um, and after that, after that, I got to do some really cool stuff. This was like the pinnacle of my two worlds of marine biology and space coming together. I got to go to the neutral buoyancy lab at the Johnson Space Center. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you guys almost lost me. Oh man, I, as soon as I got there, I was like, I, where do I give my application in? I just wanna live underwater and hang out with astronauts. Um, that was probably the, one of the cooler things uh, that I got to do. And then here's our last shot. This was after the General Assembly in 2019. We were pretty excited. It was the last tour, everything was done. It's a beautiful sunny day. Oh, it's fantastic. Coming to this, though, from such an odd place, such a disjointed place, coming to astronomy from somewhere where I'd already had to teach people about it, meant that I got a whole bunch of astronomical firsts, like way later in my life. Um, one of them, in terms of astronomy first, my favorite, and if anyone hasn't done this yet, I'm sure you're all very experienced, and I'm sure you've already done this, but was finding the Andromeda ga galaxy in binoculars. So I, I didn't even know you could use binoculars to observe. Um, and then I found out from one of our volunteers that that's actually a really good way to do things. It's cheaper, it's easier to hold on to, it's better for kids because it's more intuitive. So I went up to my cottage and I stole my dad's binoculars and I sat on the front lawn and I looked for Andromeda for 10 minutes. And I eventually found it and I immediately put the binoculars down and went, that was a fluke, and then tried it again. <laughs> Just to make sure I could still find it. And I did, and it was, it was the it was the coolest day, and I couldn't stop talking about it to anyone who would listen to me, and I'm doing it all to you again. Oh, it's so great. This photo is actually only from September, and there's Ian Wheelband. Again, this is because, since I don't own a telescope, I had no experience with this. But luckily, Ian believed in me. He set up a telescope and then said, there you go, Jenna. You do it. <laughs> I was like, okay. Sure, we can, sure, yeah, it's pointing. How hard is pointing? Um, and and I, I did eventually, like, just after sunset, I knew, I knew where the planets were, and I knew that Saturn was up, and it was going to be going down. And so I found Saturn in it, and then to be able to not only find Saturn, but see it through the scope in which you have found it was so satisfying. I know everybody talks about their first experience with Saturn and seeing it through a telescope and that being that super emotional moment, but finding it myself was like, oh, oh. I feel capable. <laughs> it doesn't happen that often. <laughs> um, and then I immediately taught a kid how to do it so that he could do it and I could talk about space. It was perfect, yeah. <laughs> so after, after that, th that was a, a big first for me, especially since it had been almost a, a, it had been, yeah, nearly a full year since I'd been working here. So really I should have been better at that by that point. Um, this was an exciting first. It's not gonna look that great, I'm gonna preface it, but I'm very proud of it. It was the first astro photo I ever took. Now, to be clear, I do not have the equipment to do this. This was while I was trying to learn what astrophotography was using this robotic telescope that we have, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So I, I managed to get like three photos of the bubble nebula or something like that, like nothing huge, one for each color, and then 
the luminance one, and I put it together, and then there were colors, and it was so cool. It made that out of black and white photos. It was a great day. I was so thrilled, and I posted it on social media, and luckily, I don't have that many astronomer friends on social media, and so they were like, yeah, that looks incredible. It's totally great. There were like one or two people who were like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, it could be better, it could be better. Um, but it was still such a big moment for me during being able to process that first image. Uh, and then in terms of saying yes to stuff and just say, kind of, you know, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I had probably the biggest, eh, what, what could go wrong kind of moment. Uh, just last year in November, one of my friends said, who we had not been friends for very long. He was like, hey, you want to go to Jordan? And I was like, sure. I mean, OK. Mm. I mean, I don't get that many offers to go to Jordan. I'd love to go to Jordan. Jordan seems really cool. Um, it was right over the transit of Mercury. And so I was already feeling terrible because I was supposed to be doing all the social media and producing content and releasing stuff. And I was going to have to just bail on all that. Um, it didn't even occur to me that I might be able to see it. Uh, but then, since I was bailing on that, I was like, well, you know, I should, I should try to see if there's anybody out there in the Jordanian world who's interested in astronomy. I'm sure there's someone. And so I did a bunch of Googling, and I found someone, and it turned out he was the vice president of the Jordanian Astronomical Society, and he was like, oh my god, I'm so excited you're coming. Let's meet up. And I was like, all right, I got three hours before I start my trip, and three hours at the end. <laughs> Do those times work? And he, he did say yes, and we met up in the lobby of the hotel five minutes after I got in. So that was after 24 hours of travel. <laughs> I was a mess. Um, his name is Dr. Amar Sakashi, and that's Adli there. Fantastic, wonderful people. I brought them the Observer's Handbook and some other stuff from the society office, and their first reaction was, come out to dinner with us. And I was like, I have meetings, I'm sorry. And they're like, great, okay, fine. Come to the Mercury Transit. And I was like, oh. That hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> I had brought like mylar and binoculars and was hoping to make something and maybe I'd be able to see something. But they were doing an event just down the street. And so they said, why don't you come to that? And I said, I, you know, I got, it's, it's going to be ending at 4 o'clock and I'm getting in at 2 o'clock that day. And like, mm -hmm. and he was like, no, 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 it's going to be great. You're going to come. It'll be great. Um, and so I said, well, we'll see what will happen. And now, because Jordan's pretty, I'm going to go through some of the photos that we took on our trip, which was not well timed with space, unfortunately. There was a waxing gibbous moon the entire time. So I could not get nice photos of space, but it did mean nice photos of Jordan. Um, you can see the moon there and some of the stars. It was beautiful, absolutely magical. Got back to go back and see it in the daytime, um, which was also gorgeous. Yeah, place is big. Um, and then I met a cat uh, and <laughs> at the monastery. It was a good day. <laughs> we actually got to go see where the Martian was filmed. Uh, so this is Wadi Rum. There's a, not this one, although it was beautiful. This is a rock that was actually in the Martian. Um, so if you rewatch it, look for that, that particular setup. It was, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful country. It was fantastic. I was really sad that all of the nice dry desert air was occupying, occupied by a full moon. But we still got to actually sleep outside one of the nights. So that was our bed there. And this was in a camp. And the moon set at about 3 in the morning. And so from 3 in the morning to like 6 in the morning when we got on camels, I didn't sleep a wink. I spent the whole time looking at the stars and trying to convince everybody else sleeping around me that they should be doing the same thing. <laughs> Which I was not a popular person. <laughs> so we, we made it back to Amman. We took this big long route and we were just, we just pulled in eventually right at 2 o'clock. Um, and at this point actually that girl there and I had become friends. And so she, was, she had really been inspired by space when she was a kid. And she'd never seen a planetary transit. So she wanted to go and take a look at stuff. So we hiked. Amman's really cool. It's built on seven hills. And so we were on one hill here, and there was another hill here. This is where the citadel was. This is where the hotel was. So we had to go down 10 flights of stairs, over like 200 feet, and then up 10 flights of stairs. But we made it just in time. We got to see Mercury projected. I know it's really tiny, but it was really exciting. It's the first planetary transit I've ever seen. So this is my biggest astronomical first, also on the other side of the world. It was very cool. Um, they had cameras set up. They had binoculars set up. I got to speak with their youngest member, who was the cutest kid in the world. It's Dana. She was seven years old. She didn't speak any English, um, but we still had a lovely conversation. She spent nothing in particular. <laughs> um, and at this event, they first of all, they presented, it was really sweet. They presented me with a plaque that had a joint sort of like RASC and JAS hosting the event, which was really nice of them to do. They must have made it fairly like quickly, and it was really neat. 
Uh, but the big thing that they offered to do, this is the coolest thing I've ever had anybody offer to do, is translate the observer's handbook into Arabic. Yeah. They just straight up, they're like, we want to translate it. And I was like, this is a 300 page document that changes every year. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 it's great. It's going to be great. It'll be great. We don't have this. We need this. We need to fill the market. Like, it'll be great. Uh, Dr. Sakaji also happened to found the Arab Union for Astronomy and Space Sciences, um, which is a whole thing across all of Arabia. So he has quite a big access to this fantastic network. And the fact that he was just sort of like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. No problem. Was like, so cool. So I, I called my boss. It was 3 AM in the Dubai airport. And, but it was a regular time in Canada. And I was like, hey, so, uh, so uh, we might be able to, to translate the, the handbook for the first time ever. Um, and he was thrilled. I'm not sure if it's going to go through this year, because what a surprise. It takes a lot of effort to translate a handbook. Um, and we need to work out copyright issues, and we need to figure out who's going to back translate it to make sure it's all good and safe and ready to go, and there's no mistakes, because we already had mistakes in this issue. Just, that was just English. So this makes it even trickier. Um, but it's sounding like it's going to go through. They're really, really, really excited about it. And this is like the coolest thing we could possibly do. Absolutely not my area. I'm the youth outreach coordinator. but. So cool, <laughs> and I'm so excited about it. This was the sunset um, that night, just as, and it was cool, just as the sun was setting in Amman, I think it was just rising in Calgary. Um, so I was texting one of our past board members and seeing how it was going over there. We had better weather here, yeah. So that was probably the coolest thing that's happened so far at this job, it was really exciting. But I do wanna tell you a little bit just about what I'm doing now because I know that some people are curious about this. Some folks have been around for a while. They're kind of interested to see what's going on. I know some of you already joined for the seminar that we had a couple weeks ago, but for those who didn't, I'm going to talk about the robotic telescope project a little bit, because this is my baby, and I'm really excited about it. And I've also spent a lot of time and sleepless nights on this. So first of all, I'm just going to do the basic introduction of the telescope. This is a telescope that we own in California. Um, it has a, where did that thing go? It has a DSLR. Whoa. There we go. It has a DSLR piggybacked on it. Um, and then the camera's back here with the filter wheel and the telescope itself. That's lit up by moonlight. And we'll, I'll, I'll give you some stats on it. So this is, this is the view of the telescope. So if you see, this is where the Canon, the uh, DSLR that's piggybacked on it, will see. And this is what the, the telescope itself will see. And so if you took a photo at that spot with the DSLR, it would look like that. And if you took it with the CCD, it would look like that. So it's a pretty solid telescope. Yeah, this is, this is like, this was not fair for me to have this project. Because like, who gets to start in astrophotography with that? That's not fair. <laughs> I'd actually, so the, the way I got into the RISC in the first place um, was that I met Ian on a night, Ian Wheelband on a night that it was cloudy and we were supposed to have a star party and we talked for like an hour about astrophotography and it was wonderful. And I was like, I didn't even know you could connect cameras to telescopes. I didn't even know it was a possibility. And now I've been put in charge of this. So I had a lot to learn. <laughs> um, turns out the thing's really good at taking pictures, uh, even if I'm not good at processing them. Um, these were ta pictures taken with the telescope. This one was taken more recently. Um, there's, this was taken with the Canon, uh, back when uh, where Tannen was close by. It's a pretty good telescope. This was, this was my last attempt at anything related to the aquatic world. This was my one attempt at the Jellyfish Nebula, which I got wildly wrong. <laughs> and no one hesitated to tell me. Um, I don't know. I'm not great with colors. And, uh, and I thought this was accurate. It's not. It should not be pink. I thought it was cute. Um, turns out I'd got the color scheme entirely wrong, and this is what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> so I got a little bit better. This was obviously the first target that I chose to program, because why wouldn't I choose to program the jellyfish? Um, and this was my, my very first attempt at editing any photos. Since then, I've tried a little bit harder, and I've still not done very well. So I'm not showing you any of the other photos that I've done. Um, a lot of other people are much better at than I am. But the, the thing with this telescope is that we wanted to use it to um, make astronomy, or sorry, astrophotography accessible, uh, get some people doing science who wouldn't normally get to, so outside of universities, and use it to teach kids about space. I didn't know how to do any of that, so I had to figure it all out. And that was why I gave this a shot. I then had to learn how to image exoplanet transits, which is surprisingly not as difficult as you would expect. There's a website that tells you everything that you need to know, 
And it, essentially what we're looking for, for anybody who doesn't know how exoplanet transits work, is we have a star, and we're looking for the planet going in front of the star. So the planet, as the planet goes in front of the star, the star gets a little bit dimmer, and then when it leaves, it gets brighter again. So what we're looking for is essentially this in the light. And this gave us all the information we needed to know in terms of where it was going to be, how long it was going to take, what time it was going to happen, the brightness of the star, the depth of the transit. This was a really big dip, which is good because we're on Earth. So it's easier to see it through the atmosphere. How long the planet takes to orbit. So it orbits every one and three quarter days. And then it basically just programmed the telescope, set it up, let it do a thing, its thing. I did not get a photo of me programming the telescope, but I did take a screenshot of when I did the jellyfish. And I, this was right after I woke up at 5.55 in the morning. I was dying to see what was happening. You just sign on to your phone and see how it's going. Uh, and it was going really well. So you can see what's happening. You can see what the pictures are coming out like and if it's going well. And then once you have all the pictures, you've got to find the actual planet. So this is the map to find the planet. There is, sorry, the star with the planet. This was the images that we took. This is upside down or this is upside down, depending on your perspective. Flipping it around. That's our star, and it was right here. That's what we're looking for. I have, this is like the step I have the most trouble with. I can't figure this out. I know five-year-olds can, but I cannot get it right. I just sit there and I'm like, I don't know, is it this way? Is it return? Flip it again? <laughs> so this is the part where I'm like, okay, high school students, you figure it out. <laughs> and after that, you start to analyze. Now, I was doing this for high school students, and so I wanted to choose software that was going to be accessible to high school students. That doesn't cost $400 to use. And so I decided to use Astro Image J, which is a free open source software that was made just for this purpose. Pro tip, if you don't have to, don't use it. It was so difficult to learn. <laughs> so I made tutorials so that nobody else has to go through having to learn how to use it again. <laughs> Um, so I spent like weeks trying to figure it out and then getting something wrong and then going to the person who was teaching me and being like, hey, wait a second, is this wrong? And he was like, oh, yeah, 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 we should have done something else. And I'm like, I already had that tutorial up for two weeks and several people have already used it. Okay. Um, so eventually it all spits it out looking like this. Um, this is just essentially seeing the star at its regular brightness, the planet coming in front and going back uh, out the other side and then compared to other stars nearby. I know that we were talking just now about the most important often in, in astronomers' lives, the most important moment being when you see Saturn for the first time. But I would argue that figuring this out was the most important moment to me. And I feel so bad for my coworkers because I spent the whole day running around with my laptop being like, look, I did science. Look at what I accomplished. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, yeah, we get it. Yeah, 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 you're excited. And I'm like, no, but see the exoplanet. You see the exoplanet. Oh, it was a great day. And so that's, that's what I want kids to feel. I want them to feel that excited about doing science. Um, it was such a fantastic experience. I actually have had a couple students run through it. And we have, I think, like 11 classes doing it this semester, which is going to be busy. This was from some kids in Montreal. So they ran through the whole project. This was early stages when I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, again, one of those like, yeah, sure, I'll do it kind of moments. <laughs> um, so I was still figuring it all out. and. A volunteer from Montreal asked if his class could do it. He was at a Sejep school. Some of you may have met him. His name's Kareem. Great guy. I felt really bad because I didn't want to just give it to the person who's with the RASC. I didn't want to show favoritism doing this. And so I went, all right, Kareem, you can do it, but I'm not helping, <laughs> which was not the right approach. <laughs> um, so he did the whole thing without asking me any questions, without having his students ask me any questions. I felt really badly about that. Um, and then afterwards, they had the same sort of struggles as me with figuring out the data, but they got it perfectly. And they even learned how to put a trend line in. I hadn't figured that out yet. Um, so they did a really, really good job. And what we ended up getting them to do was write about it. And so they wrote about it, and they published it in, in Sky News. We're going to work on doing that as well in the journal, but basically giving kids a platform to write, actually write about science, either about their experience or about the actual data, depending on the platform. Um, so that they can get some, something on their resume for the project that they've done, and they get a chance to understand how important that communication of what they've been doing is. Alrighty. Oh, man. I feel like I'm moving too fast. I spoke really quickly. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you about the other stuff that I'm doing as well. So this is another big project that I've got on my plate right now, and I'm sharing this because it is open to everybody, and a lot of people are really interested in this stuff. 
So I'm working on throwing an indigenous star party up on Manitoulin Island this summer, or this spring. Um, it's going to be Ojibwe astronomy, and we have three really awesome speakers coming in, one of whom literally wrote the book on, on Ojibwe astronomy. If you see the book in our store, it's got a really long name, but it's about Ojibwe astronomy, and that's Annette Lee. And so she's going to be coming and doing a workshop with the high school students there. Um, we're having several speakers throughout the evening talking about the stories and the creation and then the constellations that they have and giving tours of the night sky. There's going to be other cultural stuff going on too. So we've got a canoe launch and a couple guided hikes um, as well. And hopefully there's going to be some, a nice big meal at one point, which will be really fun. So this is open to everybody. I've had a lot of questions about people um, who are interested in indigenous astronomy and don't know where to start. This is going to be a really great event. It is six hours away. I apologize. But I told you guys how much I like my cottage. And this is like 30 minutes from it. <laughs> so not coincidence, that's for sure. Um, it is a fantastic place, though. It's really, really, really dark up there. Um, and it's going to be a really good time. So if anybody's interested in that, or if you know anyone who's interested in this sort of stuff, let them know. It's May 22nd to 23rd, which is the weekend after the long weekend. Just a heads up. That was a miscommunication on my part. Um, I'm also working on some other stuff, so one of these will affect you guys a little bit. We're doing, um, I'm putting together an outreach training, oh, sorry, outreach training program um, that we're working with Ontario Parks to deliver, but I want to practice first. So I know that with um, Toronto Centre, a lot of people don't have experience doing outreach and they're a little bit worried to start, um, and it can be a little intimidating. Actually, this is a problem we have pervasive throughout the society. Everybody has that issue of getting started doing outreach. So I talked to Ian Wheelband and it sounds like we're going to work on some sort of training program in the GTA to give it a run first. Doing um, rain day activities and daytime stuff and nighttime observing, star hopping, basic, basic sort of how to tell a story and how to communicate um, with new astronomers. So I'm going to work with Ian on that. You'll be hearing about that over time, I'm sure. We just started getting a new youth astrophotography section in Sky News. For those of you who've been receiving Sky News, we have a new editor in. She just started with the March-April issue, and she's fantastic. She's really doing a great job at bringing in new people and having new columns and creating ideas like this. And so we've already got four youth members who are really excited about their astro photos and who have written up um, little pieces about how to do this stuff and why they do the things that they do. So we're working on that. I've sicked a whole bunch of young people on our Instagram account, <laughs> um, which has been great. So there's, we have a new Instagram account just for young or for our younger members to encourage our younger members to join. Um, I've encouraged things like astronomy memes and done stuff like that, which doesn't normally fit the national brand, uh, but it's out there. So if you want to follow that, um, and the really exciting news is that starting tomorrow, I'm, we're going to have a co-op student in the office, um, which was another case of, hey, do you have co-op students? No, we don't. You want one? Sure. <laughs> so. This is a student who's coming. He actually wanted to work at the Science Center, um, but because they've got a, a little bit more bureaucracy involved, it didn't work out. So he's desperate to get involved in astro, astro, um, astrophysics, and he's going to start helping us out with a bunch of stuff. So if you have extra work that you want done, that's what co-op students are for. <laughs> so so far, I've, I've had a, an absolutely fantastic time wor working my way through astronomy and welcoming new people in and being welcomed by people. Toronto Center playing a big role in that because you were the ones who introduced me to space when you started coming and doing the solar observing and allowing me to take snakes to it and all that good stuff <laughs> and showing that you could actually do astronomy in the city. It was, I've, I'd never really tried before. It never occurred to me. Um, so having that experience uh, with Toronto Centre has been absolutely fantastic. It's so nice to keep working with you guys. I encourage you all to continue to agree to try new stuff, even if you don't think it's going to go well, uh, and keep your mind open about how to all these, all those things that come your way. Thank you all so much for having me. I think I spoke too fast and ran out of time. But that's okay. If you have lots of questions, I'm happy to take them now. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. I think most of us could probably sit here for a long <laughs> period of time and listen to your exploits, jellyfish or otherwise. You're not out of the woods yet, so we're going to ask for questions at this point in time, and I promise to rescue you by 10 o'clock. Oh. I actually, I'm going to briefly tell the story as the microphone makes its way over. I had contacted Chris Vaughn at 9 p.m. on like a Wednesday one night and was like, I need your help. And he's like, what kind of astronomer would I be if I wasn't up at 9 p.m. on a Wednesday? <laughs> And I really appreciated that. <laughs> you 
you saved my bacon and Alandria's that time, Chris. I really appreciated it. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Hi. Um, I actually met you. you. Well, Peter and I called you the Snake Lady. Oh, really? Oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, the telescope. Ah, uh, yes. One I'm um, so glad that Henry is my namesake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to commend you on, on the great job you're doing uh, you for so the club so far and for the society. Um, and, and it's not necessarily a, a question per se, but just to, you have great, uh, great personality and, 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 and charm and the whole works to go with it. So I just want to commend you and say continue doing the great job you're doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I actually, I had a, I almost threw this story in. I, when I uh, first got the job, Ian Wheelband reached out to me and he's like, are you, are you that girl, that girl who was like talking to me for like an hour about astrophotography? And I was like, are you the, is it you? And he's like, I can tell you by your response, it's you. Yeah. It was very sweet. Yeah. I really didn't talk about it. Just for a second, why do you slide that over to our yeah. esteemed Vice President <laughs> over there. Uh, so, uh, go, harking back to that cold winter's evening of the lunar eclipse on the parking arcade, where, as you say, it was minus plenty, uh, <laughs> have you observed with your RESC duties uh, on a colder occasion? No, that was the coldest possible occasion. I don't know if I could convince myself to go out in colder than that. <laughs> I mean, if you have a colder, do you have a colder option? I'm hoping not because yeah. it was awfully, awfully <laughs> cold that night. You, you might also remember how those news media that you were trying to entertain, how they kept running into the stairwells to keep warm. Yep. It was really rather humorous in that. Oh, so. oh, it was great. We'd run out and we'd be like, okay, here's a cool thing. Okay, back to the war room. Yeah. That's right, which was a stairwell that was unheated, but compared to the top of the parking mm -hmm. arcade, it was very warm. Yeah, there were, there were like 10 people in there. It was all the body heat. It was fine. It was great. Yeah, it was, it was something. <laughs> Uh, Jenna, we're going to have to talk about this uh, uh, what's going on in Manitoulin Island because I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Toronto Centre is running the outreach on the ferry. Yes, I did know that. Yeah, actually I'd seen that. I hadn't made the connection, but of course you are. I completely forgot about that. That would be great. It would be really cool to partner and, and work on something. That's, that's a week after the ferry starts running. Do you go up and do the outreach? Um, probably we'll be yeah. probably doing some of it this year. Okay, cool. Um, and some other folks probably will be as well. We, could, we can definitely work something out. We should chat about that. There's a, a dark sky preserve on Manitoulin Island called Gordon's Park. Um, and I believe the owners um, had some bad experiences with national, not office staff, um, representatives on occasions. Um, so we've been trying to mend those fences a bit. I think they like, they like center people. I don't think that she's getting used to me, I think, because <laughs> um, I am a lot. Um, but she, <laughs> but she, uh, she, cause she, she really likes Linda Palaya from Sudbury. Um, and we're working on sort of forming more of a partnership where we can work with them because they have great facilities and they do have, they, she's quite the business person. Her name's Rita Gordon. She is like, really good at making stuff work um, and, and is a lovely person. So yeah, let's work on, let's work on a partnership like that. We'll figure out a way to make it work. It'd be great. She, uh, she on, a, on a note of things that I did not say yes to, I actually, um, I don't know if you guys know uh, the Arrogant Worms. They had a song called Terry's Taxidermy Mount Mounted Animal Nature Trail. And that's what Gordon's Park used to be. And I went there as a kid when it was Terry's Taxidermy and Mounted Animal Nature Trail. Um, and where he would, um, he, his, uh, Terry's hobby was stuffing animals and then he'd have them on a trail and you could walk along and see the animals. I loved it as a kid. They've now turned it into a dark sky preserve. Um, and I went to visit just to chat with them and see the place and they took me on this big long tour and we went out and looked for fossils and talked about the business and all that sort of stuff and I was like, it took me three hours to figure out that that was Terry from Terry's Taxidermy and Mountain Animal Nature Trail and I had a small revelation to myself. And then they were um, chatting about it and they were saying like, why didn't you work here when they were kids? I used to work at a park up there. And they're like, why didn't you work here? You could have been, been running the place by now. And I was so close to saying, and they're, they're, it's for sale. And I was very close to saying, Maybe like, I could spend my whole time in the dark. It'd be perfect, uh, but I did not say yes to that. I'm not ready to leave the city yet. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a question from online. Uh, how oh, cool. How's your uh, your knowledge of chemistry being applied to astronomy? 
Oh, okay. So I have very limited knowledge of chemistry, but the biology, <laughs> no, that's okay. My, so my knowledge of chemistry has barely been applied, although I did learn about uh, emission spectra to be able to figure this stuff out. Um, in terms of biology, the, the sort of interesting angle on this, I do think that it's really important to cover um, lots of entry points into, into astronomy because everyone's coming from a different angle. Everybody has a different story of what they're, why they're interested in space. And so it really, that was sort of what helped me figure out new paths for people to follow. And, and with biology and, and rain biology especially, that ties in really well to space exploration because a lot of the habitats that happen underwater are basically the same ones that happen in space. So, you know, you have to be self-contained and you have to be aware of your body and where things are and not dropping tools deep into the ocean. Um, and so I think uh, being able to advise people or young people especially who are like, I want to get into space, I want to do something space, I want to go be an astronaut. And it's like, this is a good way to start, is to start underwater, because a lot of people start there, and even the astronauts start there, actually. They, they have their, their mock-up underwater. That helped a lot. I mean, just generally having that sort of like scientific curiosity and being able to, to come up with questions and then answer them methodically has really helped as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the robotic, uh, the telescope? Yeah, sure. So. Do you have specific questions about it? Uh, no, just general information. Yeah, okay, so the, the robotic telescope, um, we purchased it, the, the board of the RISC decided to purchase it uh, before I started working here. Um, and then when I got here, they'd been sort of developing the program a little bit um, and trying to get it up and running so that members of the RISC could use the telescope to do astrophotography and science and stuff like that. But it hadn't quite gotten to the point where I was ready to take it over. And then I took it over and so it was a little bit of a jump, um, and I've had to, I wrote the business plan and I, I figured it all out so that it would be making enough money to um, allow me to do outreach with it. It was very selfish of me. Um, just enough that I could do one night a week. Um, and then the telescope is basically split up into evenings, so astrophotography um, will have a team of people that will decide what targets to choose an image and how to image them, and I think they, have stand they do have standards in place for how long the images are going to be taken for depending on the target. So. Um, I don't know if I can remember them off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure that visible targets are about nine hours and uh, narrowband targets are around 20. So they basically come up with, with rules by which to do things. Um, and then there's the science team, which is uh, hope just getting going. Um, and that's looking at things like variable stars and exoplanets and stuff that we can see from on the ground. Um, and maybe doing some more fun stuff as projects. We'll see how it, go how it goes. And the outreach is all the sort of sciencey side. Eventually, once we, we get a new database system in place, because right now we can't hook up our old database system to our new website, because then we'll just have to do it all again in two months. So we're waiting until we get the new database system in to start selling the memberships. Um, and it'll be yearly. And I said this online, so I'll say it here as well. That the memberships for, we have a couple tiers. The first tier is just for access to the data that's produced with the telescope all year long, the length of your membership plus whatever's happened beforehand because it's taken so long to get up and running. Um, that's going to be $100 for the year for adults and then 50 for students because really, because <laughs> I'm in charge um, and I want to make it accessible for kids. Um, and then the science and astrophotography will each have their own teams and participation on those teams involves choosing the targets, having a discussion group and, and learning how to choose good targets because I don't know how to do that yet. Um, and that's something I think is important, how to program telescopes, how to use the software. It's going to be much more hands-on and more of a learning experience and, and sort of forming a community. And for that, we're looking at, let's hope I get this right, $300 for the year for adults and $150 for students. Again, 50% discount because I'm the youth outreach coordinator. Um, and then I, uh, when I was originally coming up with this, I set it a limit for how many people could be on those teams because I realized that the more people who are on the teams, the less fun it is. Like, the less you have a say in what's happening with the telescope. And, you know, the more people are flooding this comment section trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then someone else who's been helping me with the transition into becoming the project lead was like, you don't have that problem yet. Why are you trying to solve it? And I thought, you know, fair enough. Um, so we'll see how many people take it up. And if it becomes overrun, we'll fix it as we go. We're taking a very, like, let's see how it goes and we'll, we'll, we'll fix it as we go and we're going to learn from the experience kind of approach because we've never done this before. It's brand new, so we have a lot to learn. Um, I'm really excited about it, and I'm hoping that long run this means that we'll be able to get a separate telescope 
that we can use just for outreach because I'm selfish uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that can be housed in Australia so that students can actually use it during the daytime. Because right now, when I program in their data, they get to watch, They'll, I'll send them out a Zoom link and they can join and they can ask questions as I enter it and, and I go through you know, how to set it. It's essentially coding, so it's like you know, move the telescope to here and then take this many photos and then move it again and then take this many photos. Um, so they get to watch that whole process. But I'm hoping that they can actually like participate in it if we have a telescope that's set up that works during the daytime here and the nighttime in Australia. That is my dream. I don't know if we'll get there, but I'd love to do that. Uh, wonderful, Jenna. Thanks for coming. Um, what sort of projects could student groups do? I loved your, your presentation of the occultation of the star uh, by an exoplanet, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what other projects can you do? And is there any resource for student uh, clubs, say in high schools or CGEPs, that, that they, can, uh, they can do? So. so right now, that is the only project I have because I've only just learned how to do it. This is all since November, so it's been a pretty short order in learning this. I did get a very long email from one of the people on the science team as to a whole, a myriad of projects that we could do. And I understood like two of them. So I got to take a minute to like figure out this stuff. <laughs> um, and it was long-term projects like observing one thing every couple months for, or once a month for, anyway, it was like big long-term things, which don't make sense for schools or clubs really because that's not their time scale so exoplanets work really well because it's literally just one night that's all you need is just one night of data um, and so they can build up to it I have a form that they fill out so that they know exactly like from that website exactly what's important and why we're writing it all down um, and then they can it ends up taking about six class section class sessions so when I first started it I thought I would use it in classrooms exclusively I thought that would be the like the demographic that'd be interested in it it's not, especially not classrooms that are about to go on strike. So that went down the drain a little bit in Ontario. Um, and it did work in some other places. It worked in Montreal, and now we've got Alberta and Saskatoon on board. Um, what seems to be working really well is final projects, like kids doing these term, term projects. And then they're much more invested in the outcome, so they spend a lot of time digging in and figuring this stuff out. Um, they're not required to, it's just like, it's the project that they chose, right? So that was, that's what makes them excited about it. Um, so that also works really well for clubs. And the plan is to, as much as possible, do as much outreach as we can with that one free night. It's always going to be free, so it's going to be, it's easy enough to get clubs to be interested in it. I don't want it to cost anything, I've never wanted it to cost anything, that's not the point of outreach. Um, it's... It's set up now that we, we have, I'm just in the process of working with an individual who's making me, um, making some slides with me that, that can be used consistently when we Skype into classrooms to introduce the project and talk about exoplanets. And then I'm gonna train some volunteers to be able to do that. So it's not just me going into all the classrooms. Um, and then hopefully it'll be sort of at that point where it can kind of run steadily for a little while and we can prove that it's effective and that kids are enjoying it. Uh, and then that's when we can really start moving into new territory. I want to make sure that we're comfortable where we are first because I'm only just barely comfortable now and I'd like for more people than just me to be comfortable. I'd like to have a couple other people doing the outreach first. But then we'll get there. If you have suggestions for science projects, let me know. All right. Testing. Ah. On that note, there's one thing that uh, you have oodles of, and that's enthusiasm. And that becomes infectious, and that's a wonderful trait to have. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, and I'm going to hand you back to Ralph. Thank, Thank you, you again. So Don't go away, Jenna. Well, certainly, uh, uh, you know, the, you're a breath of fresh air. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, it's great to have such enthusiasm. And it's enthusiasm like that is infectious. Um, well, that's a bad thing to say these days, isn't it? <laughs> but, but really, it, it, it is something to, to see, um, you know, this kind of enthusiasm. Because it, it is one of the things that in science education we sometimes uh, are missing. And so uh, I think all of us here uh, share your enthusiasm and hope that you will succeed admirably in what you're doing. So thank you very much for uh, 
showing us a little bit about what you do and uh, some of your experience that uh, got you here. And uh, I would like to just present this uh, little token of appreciation to you. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and talking to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.